Dive back into the world of the March Sisters with the latest episode of Little Women, brought to you by Obsidian River Productions. In this captivating installment, we explore chapters 20, 21, and 22, each filled with the warmth, challenges, and growth that define the lives of our beloved characters. In chapter 20, Confidential, we find Lori and Joe sharing a heartfelt conversation, revealing deeper layers of their friendship and the complexities of their individual aspirations and fears. It's a testament to the strength and understanding that true friendship can offer, even in the face of life's uncertainties. Chapter 21 Lori Makes Mischief and Joe Makes Peace brings a bit of lightheartedness amidst the trials of life. Lori's spirited nature leads to an unexpected situation requiring Joe's intervention. This chapter showcases the dynamics of their relationship, blending humor with the importance of reconciliation and understanding. Moving into Chapter 22, Pleasant Meadows, we shift our focus to the tranquil and healing surroundings of the countryside. Here, the March sisters, along with Lori, find respite and joy in the simple pleasures of nature and companionship. It's a beautiful reminder of the restorative power of taking a moment to appreciate the world around us. Join us as we delve into these rich chapters, continuing our journey with Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy. Their stories of love, friendship, and growth continue to inspire and resonate with readers of all ages. And as a special gift to our listeners, we invite you to visit https colon slash slash obsidianriver.com slash gift to download a free audiobook from our collection. It's our way of saying thank you for joining us on this literary adventure. Don't forget to subscribe for more episodes from Little Women and other classics. Now, let's turn the page to these enchanting chapters and continue our journey through the lives of the March sisters. Chapter 20 Confidential I don't think I have any words in which to tell the meeting of the mother and daughters. Such hours are beautiful to live, but very hard to describe, so I will leave it to the imagination of my readers, merely saying that the house was full of genuine happiness and that Meg's tender hope was realized. For when Beth woke from that long, healing sleep, the first objects on which her eyes fell were the little rose and mother's face. Too weak to wonder at anything, she only smiled and nestled close into the loving arms about her, feeling that the hungry longing was satisfied at last. Then she slept again, and the girls waited upon their mother, for she would not unclasp the thin hand which clung to hers even in sleep. Hannah had dished up an astonishing breakfast for the traveler, finding it impossible to vent her excitement in any other way, and Meg and Joe fed their mother like dutiful young storks while they listened to her whispered account of father's state. Mr. Brooks promised to stay and nurse him, the delays which the storm occasioned on the homeward journey, and the unspeakable comfort Lori's hopeful face had given her when she arrived, worn out with fatigue, anxiety, and cold. What a strange yet pleasant day that was, so brilliant and gay without, for all the world seemed abroad to welcome the first snow, so quiet and reposeful within, for everyone slept, spent with watching, and a Sabbath stillness reigned through the house, while nodding. Hannah mounted guard at the door. With a blissful sense of burdens lifted off, Meg and Joe closed their weary eyes and lay at rest, like storm-beaten boats, safe at anchor in a quiet harbor. Mrs. March would not leave Beth's side, but rested in the big chair, waking often to look at, touch, and brood over her child, like a miser over some recovered treasure. Lori, meanwhile, posted off to comfort Amy, and told his story so well that Aunt March actually sniffed herself and never once said, I told you so. Amy came out so strong on this occasion that I think the good thoughts in the little chapel really began to bear fruit. She dried her tears quickly, restrained her impatience to see her mother, and never even thought of the turquoise ring when the old lady heartily agreed in Lori's opinion that she behaved like a capital little woman. Even Polly seemed impressed, for he called her good girl, blessed her buttons, and begged her to come and take a walk, dear, in his most affable tone. She would very gladly have gone out to enjoy the bright, wintry weather, but, discovering that Lori was dropping with sleep in spite of manful efforts to conceal the fact, she persuaded him to rest on the sofa while she wrote a note to her mother. She was a long time about it, and, when she returned, he was stretched out 
with both arms under his head, sound asleep, while Aunt March had pulled down the curtains and sat doing nothing in an unusual fit of benignity. After a while, they began to think he was not going to wake till night, and I'm not sure that he would, had he not been effectually roused by Amy's cry of joy at sight of her mother. There probably were a good many happy little girls in and about the city that day, but it is my private opinion that Amy was the happiest of all when she sat in her mother's lap and told her trials, receiving consolation and compensation in the shape of approving smiles and fond caresses. They were alone together in the chapel, to which her mother did not object when its purpose was explained to her. On the contrary, I like it very much, dear, looking from the dusty rosary to the well-worn little book and the lovely picture with its garland of evergreen. It is an excellent plan to have some place where we can go to be quiet, when things vex or grieve us. There are a good many hard times in this life of ours, but we can always bear them if we ask help in the right way. I think my little girl is learning this. Yes, mother, and when I go home, I mean to have a corner in the big closet to put my books, and the copy of that picture which I've tried to make. The woman's face is not good. It's too beautiful for me to draw. But the baby has done better, and I love it very much. I like to think he was a little child once, for then I don't seem so far away, and that helps me. As Amy pointed to the smiling Christ child on his mother's knee, Mrs. March saw something on the lifted hand that made her smile. She said nothing, but Amy understood the look, and after a minute's pause, she added gravely, I wanted to speak to you about this, but I forgot it. Aunt gave me the ring today. She called me to her and kissed me and put it on my finger and said I was a credit to her and she'd like to keep me always. She gave that funny guard to keep the turquoise on, as it's too big. I'd like to wear them, Mother, can I? They are very pretty, but I think you're rather too young for such ornaments, Amy, said Mrs. March looking at the plump little hand with the band of sky-blue stones on the forefinger and the quaint guard formed of two tiny golden hands clasped together. I'll try not to be vain, said Amy. I don't think I like it only because it's so pretty, but I want to wear it as the girl in the story wore her bracelet to remind me of something. Do you mean Aunt March? asked her mother, laughing. No, to remind me not to be selfish. Amy looked so earnest and sincere about it that her mother stopped laughing and listened respectfully to the little plan. I've thought a great deal lately about my bundle of naughties, and being selfish is the largest one in it, so I'm going to try hard to cure it if I can. Beth isn't selfish, and that's the reason everyone loves her and feels so bad at the thoughts of losing her. People wouldn't feel half so bad about me if I was sick, and I don't deserve to have them, but I'd like to be loved and missed by a great many friends, so I'm going to try and be like Beth all I can. I'm apt to forget my resolutions, but if I had something always about me to remind me, I guess I should do better. May I try this way? Yes, but I have more faith in the corner of the big closet. Wear your ring, dear, and do your best. I think you will prosper, for the sincere wish to be good is half the battle. Now I must go back to Beth. Keep up your heart, little daughter, and we will soon have you home again. That evening, while Meg was writing to her father, to report the traveler's safe arrival, Joe slipped upstairs into Beth's room and, finding her mother in her usual place, stood a minute twisting her fingers in her hair with a worried gesture and an undecided look. "'What is it, dearie?' asked Mrs. March, holding out her hand, with a face which invited confidence. "'I want to tell you something, mother.' "'About Meg?' "'How quickly you guessed. Yes, it's about her, and though it's a little thing, it fidgets me.' Beth is asleep. Speak low and tell me all about it. That Moffat hasn't been here, I hope? asked Mrs. March rather sharply. No, I should have shut the door in his face if he had, said Jo, settling herself on the floor at her mother's feet. Last summer, Meg left a pair of gloves over at the Lawrence's, and only one was returned. We forgot all about it, till Teddy told me that Mr. Brooke had it. He kept it in his waistcoat pocket, and once it fell out, and Teddy joked him about it, and Mr. Brooke owned that he liked Meg, but didn't dare say so. She was so young and he's so poor. Now, isn't it a dreadful state of things? Do you think Meg cares for him? asked Mrs. March, with an anxious look. Mercy me! I don't know anything about love and such nonsense, cried Joe, with a funny mixture of interest and contempt. In novels, the girls show it by starting and blushing, fainting away, 
growing thin and acting like fools. Now Meg does not do anything of the sort. She eats and drinks and sleeps, like a sensible creature. She looks straight in my face when I talk about that man, and only blushes a little bit when Teddy jokes about lovers. I forbid him to do it, but he doesn't mind me as he ought. Then you fancy that Meg is not interested in John? Who? cried Joe, staring. Mr. Brooke, I call him John now. We fell into the way of doing so at the hospital, and he likes it. Oh, dear. I know you'll take his part. He's been good to father, and you won't send him away. But let Meg marry him if she wants to. Mean thing. To go petting Papa and helping you, just to wheedle you into liking him. And Joe pulled her hair again with a wrathful tweak. My dear, don't get angry about it, and I will tell you how it happened. John went with me at Mr. Lawrence's request, and was so devoted to poor father that we couldn't help getting fond of him. He was perfectly open and honorable about Meg, for he told us he loved her, but would earn a comfortable home before he asked her to marry him. He only wanted our leave to love her, and work for her, and the right to make her love him if he could. He is a truly excellent young man, and we could not refuse to listen to him, but I will not consent to Meg's engaging herself so young. Of course not. It would be idiotic. I knew there was mischief brewing. I felt it. And now it's worse than I imagined. I just wish I could marry Meg myself and keep her safe in the family. This odd arrangement made Mrs. March smile, but she said gravely, Joe, I confide in you and don't wish you to say anything to Meg yet. When John comes back and I see them together, I can judge better of her feelings toward him. She'll see his in those handsome eyes that she talks about, and then it will be all up with her. She's got such a soft heart. It will melt like butter in the sun if anyone looks sentimentally at her. She read the short reports he sent more than she did your letters, and pinched me when I spoke of it, and likes brown eyes, and doesn't think John an ugly name, and she'll go and fall in love, and there's an end of peace and fun, and cozy times together. I see it all. They'll go lovering around the house, and we shall have to dodge. Meg will be absorbed, and no good to me any more. Brooke will scratch up a fortune somehow, carry her off, and make a hole in the family. And I shall break my heart, and everything will be abominably uncomfortable. Oh, dear me! Why weren't we all boys? Then there wouldn't be any bother. Jo leaned her chin on her knees, in a disconsolate attitude, and shook her fist at the reprehensible John. Mrs. March sighed, and Jo looked up with an air of relief. You don't like it, Mother? I'm glad of it. Let's send him about his business, and not tell Meg a word of it, but I'll be happy together as we always have been. I did wrong to sigh, Joe. It is natural and right you should all go to homes of your own, in time, but I do want to keep my girls as long as I can, and I'm sorry that this happened so soon, for Meg is only seventeen, and it will be some years before John can make a home for her. Your father and I have agreed that she shall not bind herself in any way, nor be married before twenty. If she and John love one another, they can wait and test the love by doing so. She is conscientious, and I have no fear of her treating him unkindly. My pretty, tender-hearted girl, I hope things will go happily with her. Hadn't you rather have her marry a rich man? asked Joe, as her mother's voice faltered a little over the last words. Money is a good and useful thing, Joe, and I hope my girls will never feel the need of it too bitterly, nor be tempted by too much. I should like to know that John was firmly established in some good business, which gave him an income large enough to keep free from debt and make Meg comfortable. I'm not ambitious for a splendid fortune, a fashionable position, or a great name for my girls. If rank and money come with love and virtue, also, I should accept them gratefully and enjoy your good fortune. But I know, by experience, how much genuine happiness can be had in a plain little house where the daily bread is earned, and some privations give sweetness to the few pleasures. I am content to see Meg begin humbly, for, if I am not mistaken, she will be rich in the possession of a good man's heart, and that is better than a fortune. I understand, mother, and quite agree, but I'm disappointed about Meg, for I'd planned to have her marry Teddy by and by, and sit in the lap of luxury all her days. Wouldn't it be nice? asked Joe, looking up with a brighter face. He is younger than she, you know, began Mrs. March, but Joe broke in. Only a little. He's old for his age and tall, and can be quite grown up in his manners if he likes. Then he's rich and generous and good, and loves us all, and I say it's a pity my plan is spoilt. 
I'm afraid Lori is hardly grown up enough for Meg, and altogether too much of a weathercock just now for anyone to depend on. Don't make plans, Joe, but let time and their own hearts mate your friends. We can't meddle safely in such matters, and had better not get romantic rubbish, as you call it, into our heads, lest it spoil our friendship. Well, I won't, but I hate to see things going all crisscross and getting snarled up, when a pull here and a snip there would straighten it out. I wish wearing flat irons on our heads would keep us from growing up, but buds will be roses, and kittens, cats, more's the pity. What's that about flat irons and cats? asked Meg, as she crept into the room with the finished letter in her hand. Only one of my stupid speeches. I'm going to bed. Come, Peggy, said Jo, unfolding herself like an animated puzzle. Quite right, and beautifully written. Please add that I send my love to John, said Mrs. March, as she glanced over the letter and gave it back. Do you call him John? asked Meg, smiling, with her innocent eyes looking down into her mother's. Yes, he has been like a son to us, and we are very fond of him, replied Mrs. March, returning the look with a keen one. I'm glad of that. He is so lonely. Good night, mother dear. It is so inexpressibly comfortable to have you here, was Meg's quiet answer. The kiss her mother gave her was a very tender one, and, as she went away, Mrs. March said, with a mixture of satisfaction and regret, She does not love John yet, but will soon learn to. Chapter 21 Lori Makes Mischief and Joe Makes Peace Joe's face was a study next day, for the secret rather weighed upon her, and she found it hard not to look mysterious and important. Meg observed it, but did not trouble herself to make inquiries, for she had learned that the best way to manage Joe was by the law of contraries, so she felt sure of being told everything if she did not ask. She was rather surprised, therefore, when the silence remained unbroken, and Joe assumed a patronizing air, which decidedly aggravated Meg, who in her turn assumed an air of dignified reserve and devoted herself to her mother. This left Joe to her own devices, for Mrs. March had taken her place as nurse and bade her rest, exercise, and amuse herself after her long confinement. Amy being gone, Lori was her only refuge, and much as she enjoyed his society, she rather dreaded him just then, for he was an incorrigible tease, and she feared he would coax her secret from her. She was quite right, for the mischief-loving lad no sooner suspected a mystery than he set himself to find it out, and led Joe a trying life of it. He wheedled, bribed, ridiculed, threatened, and scolded, affected indifference that he might surprise the truth from her declared he knew, then that he didn't care. And, at last, by dint of perseverance, he satisfied himself that it concerned Meg and Mr. Brooke. Feeling indignant that he was not taken into his tutor's confidence, he set his wits to work to devise some proper retaliation for the slight. Meg, meanwhile, had apparently forgotten the matter and was absorbed in preparations for her father's return. But all of a sudden, a change seemed to come over her, and, for a day or two, she was quite unlike herself. She started when spoken to, blushed when looked at, was very quiet, and sat over her sewing, with a timid, troubled look on her face. To her mother's inquiries, she answered that she was quite well, and Joe's she silenced by begging to be let alone. She feels it in the air, love, I mean, and she's going very fast. She's got most of the symptoms, is twittery and cross, doesn't eat, lies awake, and mopes in corners. I caught her singing that song he gave her, and once she said John, as you do, and then turned as red as a poppy. Whatever shall we do? said Joe, looking ready for any measures, however violent. Nothing but wait. Let her alone, be kind and patient, and father's coming will settle everything, replied her mother. Here's a note to you, Meg, all sealed up. How odd! Teddy never seals mine, said Joe next day, as she distributed the contents of the little post office. Mrs. March and Joe were deep in their own affairs, when a sound from Meg made them look up to see her staring at her note, with a frightened face. "'My child, what is it?' cried her mother, running to her, while Joe tried to take the paper which had done the mischief. "'It's all a mistake. He didn't send it. Oh, Joe, how could you do it?' And Meg hid her face in her hands, crying as if her heart was quite broken. "'Me! I've done nothing!' 
What's she talking about? cried Joe, bewildered. Meg's mild eyes kindled with anger as she pulled a crumpled note from her pocket and threw it at Joe, saying reproachfully, You wrote it, and that bad boy helped you. How could you be so rude, so mean, and cruel to us both? Joe hardly heard her, for she and her mother were reading the note, which was written in a peculiar hand. My dearest Margaret, I can no longer restrain my passion, and must know my fate before I return. I dare not tell your parents yet, but I think they would consent if they knew that we adored one another. Mr. Lawrence will help me to some good place, and then, my sweet girl, you will make me happy. I implore you to say nothing to your family yet, but to send one word of hope through Lori to your devoted John. Oh, the little villain! That's the way he meant to pay me for keeping my word to mother. I'll give him a hearty scolding and bring him over to beg pardon, cried Joe, burning to execute immediate justice. But her mother held her back, saying, with a look she seldom wore, Stop, Joe, you must clear yourself first. You have played so many pranks that I'm afraid you have had a hand in this. On my word, mother, I haven't. I never saw that note before and don't know anything about it, as true as I live, said Joe, so earnestly that they believed her. If I had taken a part in it, I'd have done it better than this and have written a sensible note. I should think you'd have known Mr. Brooke wouldn't write such stuff as that, she added, scornfully tossing down the paper. It's like his writing, faltered Meg, comparing it with the note in her hand. Oh, Meg, you didn't answer it? cried Mrs. March quickly. Yes, I did, and Meg hid her face again, overcome with shame. Here's a scrape. Do let me bring that wicked boy over to explain and be lectured. I can't rest till I get hold of him. And Joe made for the door again. Hush, let me manage this, for it is worse than I thought. Margaret, tell me the whole story commanded Mrs. March, sitting down by Meg, yet keeping hold of Joe, lest she should fly off. I received the first letter from Lori, who didn't look as if he knew anything about it, began Meg, without looking up. I was worried at first, and meant to tell you. Then I remembered how you liked Mr. Brooke, so I thought you wouldn't mind if I kept my little secret for a few days. I'm so silly that I like to think no one knew, and while I was deciding what to say, I felt like the girls in books, who have such things to do, Forgive me, mother. I'm paid for my silliness now. I never can look him in the face again. What did you say to him? asked Mrs. March. I only said I was too young to do anything about it yet, that I didn't wish to have secrets from you, and he must speak to father. I was very grateful for his kindness and would be his friend, but nothing more for a long while. Mrs. March smiled, as if well pleased, and Joe clapped her hands, exclaiming with a laugh, you are almost equal to Caroline Percy, who is a pattern of prudence. Tell on, Meg, what did he say to that? He writes in a different way entirely, telling me that he never sent any love letter at all, and is very sorry that my roguish sister Joe should take such liberties with our names. It's very kind and respectful, but think how dreadful for me. Meg leaned against her mother, looking the image of despair, and Joe tramped about the room, calling Lori names. All of a sudden she stopped, caught up the two notes, and, after looking at them closely, said decidedly, I don't believe Brooke ever saw either of these letters. Teddy wrote both, and keeps yours to crow over me with, because I wouldn't tell him my secret. Don't have any secrets, Joe. Tell it to Mother, and keep out of trouble, as I should have done, said Meg warningly. Bless you, child. Mother told me. That will do, Joe. I'll comfort Meg while you go and get Lori. I shall sift the matter to the bottom and put a stop to such pranks at once. Away ran Joe, and Mrs. March gently told Meg Mr. Brooks' real feelings. Now, dear, what are your own? Do you love him enough to wait till he can make a home for you, or will you keep yourself quite free for the present? I've been so scared and worried, I don't want to have anything to do with lovers for a long while. Perhaps never, answered Meg petulantly. If John doesn't know anything about this nonsense, don't tell him, and make Joe and Lori hold their tongues. I won't be deceived and plagued and made a fool of. It's a shame. Seeing that Meg's usually gentle temper was roused and her pride hurt by this mischievous joke, Mrs. March soothed her by promises of entire silence and great discretion for the future. The instant Lori's step was heard in the hall, Meg fled into the study 
and Mrs. March received the culprit alone. Joe had not told him why he was wanted, fearing he wouldn't come. But he knew the minute he saw Mrs. March's face and stood twirling his hat with a guilty air which convicted him at once. Joe was dismissed, but chose to march up and down the hall like a sentinel, having some fear that the prisoner might bolt. The sound of voices in the parlor rose and fell for half an hour. But what happened during that interview, the girls never knew. When they were called in, Lori was standing by their mother, with such a penitent face that Joe forgave him on the spot, but did not think it wise to betray the fact. Meg received his humble apology and was much comforted by the assurance that Brooke knew nothing of the joke. I'll never tell him to my dying day. Wild horses shan't drag it out of me. So you'll forgive me, Meg, and I'll do anything to show how out-and-out out sorry I am, he added, looking very much ashamed of himself. I'll try, but it was a very ungentlemanly thing to do. I didn't think you could be so sly and malicious, Lori, replied Meg, trying to hide her maidenly confusion under a gravely reproachful air. It was altogether abominable, and I don't deserve to be spoken to for a month. But you will, though, won't you? And Lori folded his hands together with such an imploring gesture as he spoke in his irresistibly persuasive tone that it was impossible to frown upon him in spite of his scandalous behavior. Meg pardoned him, and Mrs. March's grave face relaxed, in spite of her efforts to keep sober, when she heard him declare that he would atone for his sins by all sorts of penances and abase himself like a worm before the injured damsel. Joe stood aloof, meanwhile, trying to harden her heart against him and succeeding only in priming up her face into an expression of entire disapprobation. Laurie looked at her once or twice, but as she showed no sign of relenting, he felt injured and turned his back on her till the others were done with him when he made her a low bow and walked off without a word. As soon as he had gone, she wished she'd been more forgiving, and when Meg and her mother went upstairs, she felt lonely and longed for Teddy. After resisting for some time, she yielded to the impulse and, armed with a book to return, went over to the big house. "'Is Mr. Lawrence in?' asked Joe of a housemaid, who was coming downstairs. "'Yes, miss, but I don't believe he's seeable just yet. "'Why not? Is he ill?' "'La, no, miss, but he's had a scene with Mr. Lorry, who is in one of his tantrums about something, which vexes the old gentleman, so I durstn't go nigh him. "'Where is Lorry? Shut up in his room, and he won't answer, though I've been a-tapping. I don't know what's to become of the dinner, for it's ready, and there's no one to eat it. I'll go and see what the matter is. I'm not afraid of either of them. Up went Joe, and knocked smartly on the door of Lori's little study. Stop that, or I'll open the door and make you, called out the young gentleman in a threatening tone. Joe immediately knocked again. The door flew open, and in she bounced, before Lori could recover from his surprise. Seeing that he really was out of temper, Joe, who knew how to manage him, assumed a contrite expression, and going artistically down upon her knees, said meekly, Please forgive me for being so cross. I came to make it up, and can't go away till I have. It's all right. Get up, and don't be a goose, Joe, was the cavalier reply to her petition. Thank you, I will. Could I ask what's the matter? You don't look exactly easy in your mind. I've been shaken, and I won't bear it growled Lori indignantly. "'Who did it?' demanded Joe. "'Grandfather, if it had been anyone else I'd have—' And the injured youth finished his sentence by an energetic gesture of the right arm. "'That's nothing. I often shake you and you don't mind,' said Joe soothingly. "'Pooh, you're a girl and it's fun, but I'll allow no man to shake me. "'I don't think anyone would care to try it if you looked as much like a thundercloud as you do now. Why were you treated so?' just because I wouldn't say what your mother wanted me for. I'd promised not to tell, and of course I wasn't going to break my word. Couldn't you satisfy your grandpa in any other way? No, he would have the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I'd have told my part of the scrape if I could without bringing Meg in. As I couldn't, I held my tongue and bore the scolding till the old gentleman collared me. Then I got angry and bolted for fear I should forget myself. It wasn't nice, but he's sorry, I know, so go down and make up. I'll help you. Hanged if I do. I'm not going to be lectured and pummeled by everyone, just for a bit of a frolic. I was sorry about Meg, and begged pardon like a man, but I won't do it again when I wasn't in the wrong. He didn't know that. 
He ought to trust me and not act as if I was a baby. It's no use, Joe. He's got to learn that I'm able to take care of myself and don't need anyone's apron string to hold on by. What pepper pots you are, sighed Joe. How do you mean to settle this affair? Well, he ought to beg pardon, and believe me when I say I can't tell him what the fuss is about. Bless you, he won't do that. I won't go down till he does. Now, Teddy, be sensible, let it pass, and I'll explain what I can. You can't stay here, so what's the use of being melodramatic? I don't intend to stay here long, anyway. I'll slip off and take a journey somewhere, and when Grandpa misses me, he'll come round fast enough. I dare say, but you ought not to go and worry him. Don't preach. I'll go to Washington and see Brooke. It's gay there, and I'll enjoy myself after the troubles. What fun you'd have! I wish I could run off too, said Joe, forgetting her part of mentor in lively visions of martial life at the Capitol. Come on then, why not? You go and surprise your father, and I'll stir up old Brooke. It would be a glorious joke. Let's do it, Joe. We'll leave a letter saying we are all right and trot off at once. I've got money enough. It will do you good and be no harm as you go to your father. For a moment, Joe looked as if she would agree, for wild as the plan was, it just suited her. She was tired of care and confinement, longed for change, and thoughts of her father blended temptingly with the novel charms of camps and hospitals, liberty and fun. Her eyes kindled as they turned wistfully toward the window, but they fell on the old house opposite, and she shook her head with sorrowful decision. If I was a boy, we'd run away together and have a capital time. But as I'm a miserable girl, I must be proper and stop at home. Don't tempt me, Teddy. It's a crazy plan. That's the fun of it, began Laurie, who had got a willful fit on him and was possessed to break out of bounds in some way. Hold your tongue, cried Joe, covering her ears. Prunes and prisms are my doom, and I may as well make up my mind to it. I came here to moralize, not to hear about things that make me skip to think of. I know Meg would wet blanket such a proposal, but I thought you had more spirit, began Lori insinuatingly. Bad boy, be quiet. Sit down and think of your own sins. Don't go making me add to mine. If I get your grandpa to apologize for the shaking, will you give up running away? asked Joe seriously. Yes, but you won't do it answered Lori, who wished to make up, but felt that his outraged dignity must be appeased first. If I can manage the young one, I can the old one, muttered Joe as she walked away, leaving Lori bent over a railroad map with his head propped up on both hands. Come in! And Mr. Lawrence's gruff voice sounded gruffer than ever as Joe tapped at his door. It's only me, sir, come to return a book, she said blandly as she entered. Want any more? asked the old gentleman, looking grim and vexed, but trying not to show it. Yes, please. I like old Sam so well, I think I'll try the second volume, returned Joe, hoping to propitiate him by accepting a second dose of Boswell's Johnson, as he had recommended that lively work. The shaggy eyebrows unbent a little, as he rolled the steps toward the shelf where the Johnsonian literature was placed. Joe skipped up, and, sitting on the top step, affected to be searching for her book, but was really wondering how best to introduce the dangerous object of her visit. Mr. Lawrence seemed to suspect that something was brewing in her mind, for, after taking several brisk turns about the room, he faced round on her, speaking so abruptly that Rasselas tumbled face downward on the floor. What has that boy been about? Don't try to shield him. I know he has been in mischief by the way he acted when he came home. I can't get a word from him. And when I threatened to shake the truth out of him, he bolted upstairs and locked himself into his room. He did do wrong, but we forgave him, and all promised not to say a word to anyone, began Joe reluctantly. That won't do. He shall not shelter himself behind a promise from you soft-hearted girls. If he's done anything amiss, he shall confess, beg pardon, and be punished. Out with it, Joe. I won't be kept in the dark. Mr. Lawrence looked so alarming and spoke so sharply that Joe would have gladly run away if she could, but she was perched aloft on the steps, and he stood at the foot, a lion in the path, so she had to stay and brave it out. Indeed, sir, I cannot tell. Mother forbade it. Lori has confessed, asked pardon, and been punished quite enough. We don't keep silence to shield him, but someone else, and it will make more trouble if you interfere. 
Please don't. It was partly my fault, but it's all right now, so let's forget it and talk about the Rambler or something pleasant. Hang the Rambler, come down, and give me your word that this harem scarum boy of mine hasn't done anything ungrateful or impertinent. If he has, after all your kindness to him, I'll thrash him with my own hands. The threat sounded awful, but did not alarm Joe, for she knew the irascible old gentleman would never lift a finger against his grandson, whatever he might say to the contrary. She obediently descended and made as light of the prank as she could without betraying Meg or forgetting the truth. Hmm, ha, well, if the boy held his tongue because he promised, and not from obstinacy, I'll forgive him. He's a stubborn fellow and hard to manage, said Mr. Lawrence, rubbing up his hair till it looked as if he had been out in a gale and smoothing the frown from his brow with an air of relief. So am I. But a kind word will govern me when all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't, said Joe, trying to say a kind word for her friend, who seemed to get out of one scrape only to fall into another. You think I'm not kind to him, hey? was the sharp answer. Oh dear, no sir, you are rather too kind sometimes, and then just a trifle hasty when he tries your patience. Don't you think you are? Joe was determined to have it out now, and tried to look quite placid, though she quaked a little after her bold speech. To her great relief and surprise, the old gentleman only threw his spectacles onto the table with a rattle and exclaimed frankly, You're right, girl, I am. I love the boy, but he tries my patience past bearing, and I don't know how it will end if we go on so. I'll tell you, he'll run away. Joe was sorry for that speech the minute it was made. She meant to warn him that Laurie would not bear much restraint and hoped he would be more forbearing with the lad. Mr. Lawrence's ruddy face changed suddenly, and he sat down with a troubled glance at the picture of a handsome man which hung over his table. It was Laurie's father who had run away in his youth and married against the imperious old man's will. Joe fancied he remembered and regretted the past, and she wished she had held her tongue. He won't do it unless he is very much worried and only threatens it sometimes when he gets tired of studying. I often think I should like to, especially since my hair was cut. So if you ever miss us, you may advertise for two boys and look among the ships bound for India. She laughed as she spoke, and Mr. Lawrence looked relieved, evidently taking the whole as a joke. You hussy, how dare you talk in that way? Where's your respect for me and your proper bringing up? Bless the boys and girls. What torments they are, yet we can't do without them, he said, pinching her cheeks good-humoredly. Go and bring that boy down to his dinner. Tell him it's all right, and advise him not to put on tragedy airs with his grandfather. I won't bear it. He won't come, sir. He feels badly because you didn't believe him when he said he couldn't tell. I think the shaking hurt his feelings very much. Joe tried to look pathetic, but must have failed, for Mr. Lawrence began to laugh, and she knew the day was won. I'm sorry for that, and ought to thank him for not shaking me, I suppose. What the dickens does the fellow expect? And the old gentleman looked a trifle ashamed of his own testiness. If I were you, I'd write him an apology, sir. He says he won't come down till he has one, and talks about Washington, and goes on in an absurd way. A formal apology will make him see how foolish he is, and bring him down quite amiable. Try it. He likes fun, and this way is better than talking. I'll carry it up and teach him his duty. Mr. Lawrence gave her a sharp look and put on his spectacles, saying slowly, You're a sly puss, but I don't mind being managed by you and Beth. Here, give me a bit of paper and let us have done with this nonsense. Uh, the note was written in the terms which one gentleman would use to another after offering some deep insult. Joe dropped a kiss on the top of Mr. Lawrence's bald head and ran up to slip the apology under Laurie's door, advising him, through the keyhole, to be submissive, decorous, and a few other agreeable impossibilities. Finding the door locked again, she left the note to do its work and was going quietly away, when the young gentleman slid down the banisters and waited for her at the bottom, saying, with his most virtuous expression of countenance, "'What a good fellow you are, Joe. Did you get blown up?' he added, laughing. "'No, he was pretty mild on the whole. "'Ah, I got it all round.' Even you cast me off over there, and I felt just ready to go to the deuce, he began apologetically. Don't talk in that way. Turn over a new leaf and begin again, Teddy, my son. 
I keep turning over new leaves and spoiling them as I used to spoil my copybooks, and I make so many beginnings there never will be an end, he said dolefully. Go and eat your dinner. You'll feel better after it. Men always croak when they are hungry. And Joe whisked out at the front door after that. That's a label on my sect, answered Laurie, quoting Amy, as he went to partake of humble pie dutifully with his grandfather, who was quite saintly in temper and overwhelmingly respectful in manner all the rest of the day. Everyone thought the matter ended and the little cloud blown over. But the mischief was done, for, though others forgot it, Meg remembered. She never alluded to a certain person, but she thought of him a good deal, dreamed dreams more than ever. And once Joe, rummaging her sister's desk for stamps, found a bit of paper scribbled over with the words, Mrs. John Brooke, whereat she groaned tragically and cast it into the fire, feeling that Laurie's prank had hastened the evil day for her. Chapter 22 Pleasant Meadows Shaw like sunshine after storm were the peaceful weeks which followed. The invalids improved rapidly, and Mr. March began to talk of returning early in the new year. Beth was soon able to lie on the study sofa all day, amusing herself with the well-beloved cats at first, and, in time, with dolls sewing, which had fallen sadly behind hand. Her once active limbs were so stiff and feeble that Joe took her a daily airing about the house in her strong arms. Meg cheerfully blackened and burnt her white hands, cooking delicate messes for the deer, while Amy, a loyal slave of the ring, celebrated her return by giving away as many of her treasures as she could prevail on her sisters to accept. As Christmas approached, the usual mysteries began to haunt the house, and Joe frequently convulsed the family by proposing utterly impossible or magnificently absurd ceremonies in honor of this unusually merry Christmas. Lori was equally impracticable, and would have had bonfires, skyrockets, and triumphal arches if he had had his own way. After many skirmishes and snubbings, the ambitious pair were considered effectually quenched, and went about with forlorn faces, which were rather belied by explosions of laughter when the two got together. Several days of unusually mild weather fitly ushered in a splendid Christmas day. Hannah felt in her bones that it was going to be an unusually fine day, and she proved herself a true prophetess, for everybody and everything seemed bound to produce a grand success. To begin with, Mr. March wrote that he should soon be with them. Then Beth felt uncommonly well that morning, and being dressed in her mother's gift, a soft crimson merino wrapper, was borne in triumph to the window to behold the offering of Joe and Lori. The unquenchables had done their best to be worthy of the name, for, like elves, they had worked by night and conjured up a comical surprise. Out in the garden stood a stately snow maiden, crowned with holly, bearing a basket of fruit and flowers in one hand, a great roll of new music in the other, a perfect rainbow of an afghan round her chilly shoulders, and a Christmas carol issuing from her lips on a pink paper streamer. The Jungfrau to Beth God bless you, dear Queen Bess. May nothing you dismay, but health and peace and happiness. Be yours this Christmas day. Here's fruit to feed our busy bee, and flowers for her nose. Here's music for her peony, an afghan for her toes. A portrait of Joanna, see, by Raphael Notu, who labored with great industry to make it fair and true. Accept a ribbon red, I beg, for Madame Purrer's tail, an ice cream made by lovely Peg, a Mont Blanc in a pail. Their dearest love my makers laid within my breast of snow. Accept it, and the alpine maid, from Lori and from Joe. How Beth laughed when she saw it, how Lori ran up and down to bring in the gifts, and what ridiculous speeches Joe made as she presented them. I'm so full of happiness that, if Father was only here, I couldn't hold one drop more, said Beth, quite sighing with contentment as Joe carried her off to the study to rest after the excitement and to refresh herself with some of the delicious grapes the young Frau had sent her. So am I, added Joe slapping the pocket wherein reposed the long-desired Undine and Sintram. "'I'm sure I am,' echoed Amy, poring over the engraved copy of the Madonna and Child, which her mother had given her in a pretty frame. "'Of course I am,' cried Meg, smoothing the silvery folds of her first silk dress, for Mr. Lawrence had insisted on giving it. "'How can I be otherwise?' said Mrs. March gratefully, as her eyes went from her husband's letter to Beth's smiling face, 
and her hand caressed the brooch made of gray and golden, chestnut and dark brown hair, which the girls had just fastened on her breast. Now and then, in this workaday world, things do happen in the delightful storybook fashion, and what a comfort that is. Half an hour after everyone had said they were so happy they could only hold one drop more, the drop came. Lori opened the parlor door and popped his head in very quietly. He might just as well have turned a somersault and uttered an Indian war whoop, for his face was so full of suppressed excitement and his voice so treacherously joyful that everyone jumped up, though he only said in a queer, breathless voice, Here's another Christmas present for the March family. Before the words were well out of his mouth, he was whisked away somehow, and in his place appeared a tall man, muffled up to the eyes, leaning on the arm of another tall man, who tried to say something and couldn't. Of course there was a general stampede, and for several minutes everybody seemed to lose their wits, for the strangest things were done, and no one said a word. Mr. March became invisible in the embrace of four pairs of loving arms. Joe disgraced herself by nearly fainting away, and had to be doctored by Lori in the china closet. Mr. Brooke kissed Meg entirely by mistake, as he somewhat incoherently explained, and Amy, the dignified, tumbled over a stool and, never stopping to get up, hugged and cried over her father's boots in the most touching manner. Mrs. March was the first to recover herself and held up her hand with a warning, Hush! Remember Beth! But it was too late. The study door flew open, the little red wrapper appeared on the threshold, Joy put strength into the feeble limbs, and Beth ran straight into her father's arms. Never mind what happened just after that, for the full hearts overflowed, washing away the bitterness of the past and leaving only the sweetness of the present. It was not at all romantic, but a hearty laugh set everybody straight again, for Hannah was discovered behind the door, sobbing over the fat turkey, which she had forgotten to put down when she rushed up from the kitchen. As the laugh subsided, Mrs. March began to thank Mr. Brooke for his faithful care of her husband, at which Mr. Brooke suddenly remembered that Mr. March needed rest, and, seizing Lori, he precipitately retired. Then the two invalids were ordered to repose, which they did, by both sitting in one big chair and talking hard. Mr. March told how he had longed to surprise them, and how, when the fine weather came, he had been allowed by his doctor to take advantage of it, how devoted Brooke had been, and how he was altogether a most estimable and upright young man. Why Mr. March paused a minute just there, and, after a glance at Meg, who was violently poking the fire, looked at his wife with an inquiring lift of the eyebrows. I leave you to imagine. Also, why Mrs. March gently nodded her head and asked, rather abruptly, if he wouldn't have something to eat. Joe saw and understood the look, and she stalked grimly away to get wine and beef tea, muttering to herself, as she slammed the door, I hate estimable young men with brown eyes. There never was such a Christmas dinner as they had that day. The fat turkey was a sight to behold when Hannah sent him up, stuffed, browned, and decorated. So was the plum pudding, which quite melted in one's mouth. Likewise the jellies, in which Amy reveled like a fly in a honey pot. Everything turned out well, which was a mercy, Hannah said. For my mind was that flustered, Mum, that it's a miracle I didn't roast the pudding and stuff the turkey with raisins, let alone bilin' of it in a cloth. Mr. Lawrence and his grandson dined with them, also Mr. Brooke, at whom Joe glowered darkly, to Lori's infinite amusement. Two easy chairs stood side by side at the head of the table, in which sat Beth and her father, feasting modestly on chicken and a little fruit. They drank healths, told stories, sung songs, reminisced, as the old folks say, and had a thoroughly good time. A sleigh ride had been planned, but the girls would not leave their father. So the guests departed early, and, as twilight gathered, the happy family sat together round the fire. Just a year ago, we were groaning over the dismal Christmas we expected to have. Do you remember? asked Joe, breaking a short pause, which had followed a long conversation about many things. Rather a pleasant year on the whole, said Meg, smiling at the fire and congratulating herself on having treated Mr. Brooke with dignity. I think it's been a pretty hard one, observed Amy, watching the light shine on her ring with thoughtful eyes. I'm glad it's over, because we've got you back, whispered Beth, who sat on her father's knee. 
Rather a rough road for you to travel, my little pilgrims, especially the latter part of it. But you have got on bravely, and I think the burdens are in a fair way to tumble off very soon, said Mr. March, looking with fatherly satisfaction at the four young faces gathered round him. How do you know? Did Mother tell you? asked Joe. Not much. Straws show which way the wind blows, and I've made several discoveries today. Oh, tell us what they are, cried Meg, who sat beside him. Here is one. And taking up the hand which lay on the arm of his chair, he pointed to the roughened forefinger, a burn on the back, and two or three little hard spots on the palm. I remember a time when this hand was white and smooth, and your first care was to keep it so. It was very pretty then, but to me it is much prettier now, for in these seeming blemishes I read a little history. A burnt offering has been made of vanity. This hardened palm has earned something better than blisters, and I'm sure the sewing done by these pricked fingers will last a long time. So much goodwill went into the stitches. Meg, my dear, I value the womanly skill which keeps home happy more than white hands or fashionable accomplishments. I'm proud to shake this good, industrious little hand and hope I shall not soon be asked to give it away. If Meg had wanted a reward for hours of patient labor, she received it in the hearty pressure of her father's hand and the approving smile he gave her. What about Joe? Please say something nice, for she has tried so hard and been so very, very good to me, said Beth in her father's ear. He laughed and looked across at the tall girl who sat opposite, with an unusually mild expression in her brown face. In spite of the curly crop, I don't see the son Joe whom I left a year ago, said Mr. March. I see a young lady who pins her collar straight, laces her boots neatly, and neither whistles, talks slang, nor lies on the rug as she used to do. Her face is rather thin and pale just now, with watching and anxiety. But I like to look at it, for it has grown gentler, and her voice is lower. She doesn't bounce, but moves quietly, and takes care of a certain little person in a motherly way which delights me. I rather miss my wild girl, but if I get a strong, helpful, tender-hearted woman in her place, I shall feel quite satisfied. I don't know whether the shearing sobered our black sheep, but I do know that in all Washington I couldn't find anything beautiful enough to be bought with the five and twenty dollars which my good girl sent me. Joe's keen eyes were rather dim for a minute, and her thin face grew rosy in the firelight as she received her father's praise, feeling that she did deserve a portion of it. Now, Beth, said Amy, longing for her turn, but ready to wait. There's so little of her, I'm afraid to say much, for fear she will slip away altogether, though she is not so shy as she used to be, began their father cheerfully. But recollecting how nearly he had lost her, he held her close, saying tenderly, with her cheek against his own, I've got you safe, my Beth, and I'll keep you so, please, God. After a minute's silence, he looked down at Amy, who sat on the cricket at his feet, and said, with a caress of the shining hair, I observed that Amy took drumsticks at dinner, ran errands for her mother all the afternoon, gave Meg her place tonight, and has waited on everyone with patience and good humor. I also observe that she does not fret much, nor look in the glass, and has not even mentioned a very pretty ring which she wears. So I conclude that she has learned to think of other people more and of herself less, and has decided to try and mold her character as carefully as she molds her little clay figures. I am glad of this, for though I should be very proud of a graceful statue made by her, I shall be infinitely prouder of a lovable daughter with a talent for making life beautiful to herself and others. What are you thinking of, Beth? asked Joe, when Amy had thanked her father and told about her ring. I read in Pilgrim's Progress today how, after many troubles, Christian and Hopeful came to a pleasant green meadow where lilies bloomed all the year round, and there they rested happily, as we do now, before they went on to their journey's end, answered Beth adding, as she slipped out of her father's arms and went slowly to the instrument, It's singing time now, and I want to be in my old place. I'll try to sing the song of the shepherd boy which the pilgrims heard. I made the music for father because he likes the verses. So, sitting at the dear little piano, Beth softly touched the keys, and, in the sweet voice they had never thought to hear again, sung to her own accompaniment the quaint hymn, which was a singularly fitting song for her. He that is down need fear no fall, he that is low no pride, he that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. 
I am content with what I have, little be it or much, and Lord, contentment still I crave, because Thou savest such. Fullness to them a burden is, that go on pilgrimage, here little, and hereafter bliss, is best from age to age. As we close the chapters on another heartfelt episode of Little Women, reflecting on the events of chapters 20, 21, and 22, we're reminded once again of the enduring themes of friendship, reconciliation, and the beauty of nature that Louisa May Alcott so masterfully weaves into the fabric of the March sisters' lives. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the lives of Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy. Their stories of growth, understanding, and simple joys continue to resonate, offering us lessons and reflections on our own lives. If you've enjoyed delving deeper into the world of the March sisters with us, please consider subscribing to Obsidian River Productions. Your support helps us bring these timeless tales to life and share the magic of classic literature with a broader audience. Don't forget, as a token of our appreciation, we're offering you a free audiobook download. Visit https colon slash slash obsidianriver.com slash gift to explore our collection and find your next literary adventure. We look forward to continuing this journey with you, exploring the trials and triumphs of the March family. Stay tuned for more episodes from Little Women and other beloved classics. Until next time, keep the spirit of these stories alive in your heart and share the joy of reading with those around you.